Good evening, everybody, and thank you for the for the introduction, Nikki. As she said, that I am BDA's um, lead tutor for our new Level Five Dyscalculia course for teachers. This is an amazingly um, exciting time to um, be developing all these Dyscalculia courses because Dyscalculia is about thirty years behind dyslexia. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about dyscalculia, but mainly maths learning difficulties and how you can support your um, your child with um, with maths difficulties. But like all um, all good research, it tends to come through a specific learning difficulty. So, for example, all the good research into how children should be learning phonics came through um, work that was done with how um, children who found reading and spelling, i.e. if they had dyslexia, um, learned to read. And now we're beginning to see the same thing um, for dyscalculia and maths learning difficulties. But as I say, we're about 20, uh, 30 years behind dyslexia, but catching up very, very fast. And the British Dyslexia Association is soon going to launch its particular or specific arm, which is going to be called Dyscalculia UK, and that will be part of the British Dyslexia Association. So I'm very pleased to have you here this evening. I hope you'll have lots of questions for me at the end. Um, so Nikki, yes, if you'd like to give me the prompt to um, share my screen, that would be great. Thank I will you. do, hopefully. You should be able to see that now. Thanks, Brenda. Okay, so show my screen. Um, and hopefully off we go. Good. Um, so this is a, a talk that's mainly directed at parents, since um, parents now have been playing a huge role in the teaching of their children under the present um, conditions. But I'm hoping that there are many parents, out, I mean, many teachers out there as well. So the focus really is how can parents encourage a confidence and awareness of number in their children? And that's because too often we hear children say, I hate maths or parents say, I couldn't do maths at school. And so this brief talk will look at how children acquire math skills and what are the sorts of influences and experiences that impair the progress of learning maths. The talk will also address lots of practical ways that parents can encourage and help their child to develop a positive enjoyment and success in maths. So maths is a little bit like Marmite. You people seem to either um, love the subject or hate the subject. And some people will even go as far as admitting that they were rubbish at maths at school, but would never admit the same for English. There seems to be an OK to be rubbish at maths, but not OK to be not so good at English. So there are lots of misconceptions about maths that we have that it's um, a subject for very brainy people, or it's a subject for boys, or it's a subject that we don't need in everyday life. Um, unless you're going to do a career in, say, engineering or accountancy. But actually, it is a very, very important subject that we need every day for everyday living. So if we just spend a couple of minutes thinking about how many times a day we actually use maths abilities. So it could be cooking and making recipes. Um, it could be time and planning the day, especially if we're working from home. It could be budgeting and ordering for Christmas or having enough space in the larder or in the home to put everything where we put that we've purchased, so spatial awareness. And of course, there are many other things that we may be not so aware of, but are also equally important, like interest rates on our credit cards, um, differences between the tariffs on our energy supplies, or taking advantage of sort of Black Friday deals. Are they in fact deals? Are these three for two or whatever it is, deals that you get in the supermarket, are they in fact um, proper deals if we did the maths properly? So, but there's some very, some very alarming things that have been going on um, for a number of years. And these are them, that in March um, 2014, 
Uh, poor math skills were estimated to cost the British economy about 20.2 20 20 billion a year, and that 87% of the 26.7 uh, working age adults had numeracy skills that below that of a GCSE grade D, which is not a pass. And that one in five shoppers said that they couldn't convert currency when they went on holiday. Even more alarming is that 25% of 11 year olds leave primary school without the, achieving the expected level and 5% fail to achieve the numerous skills of a seven year old. So besides the sort of research into maths learning difficulties, we're looking at a whole number of things related to maths. And the figures from the, o, the OECD, which is the um, which was um, the operation for the development um, measured over the last six years showed that mathematics standards among 15 year olds have plummeted with 16 countries overtaking Britain since the year 2000, including Slovakia, Belgium and the Netherlands, Denmark and Austria. And the UK has fallen to eighth from, from eighth to 24th place in the international league table. Now that was in 2007 and um, we are still falling. So what is going on, you may ask? Is it to do with teaching methods? Is it to do with poor the poor importance of maths in this country or stereotyping or maybe parental experiences that are being passed on? And all of that is absolutely true, that um, teaching methods have changed or did change in about the 90s. Um, and we went on to a very procedural way of maths. And um, all the parents that I'm probably talking to out there who've got young children, um, and this, this webinar is, is sort of addressed to that audience, probably came into that group of, of um, little ones when they were little ones who were taught in that very procedural driven way rather than exploring maths and using concrete materials and we're now beginning to think or have been for some time that um, this procedure in abstract maths is being introduced too soon and that we should actually be continuing with concrete materials right through to the beginning of, of secondary school and beyond. Um, We've also got quite a low importance to maths in this country compared to, for example, the Asian countries where maths is um, a very esteemed um, subject. And there's also more stereotyping here, as I say, that, that a lot of girls perceive that maths is a boy's subject and that it only leads to careers in things like engineering and um, accountancy. But in fact, to be a good set designer or a theatre person or an interior designer or an architect, um, you also need math skills. And of course, there should, no, should not be any barriers to girls going into um, careers that, you know, 30 years ago were traditionally um, male dominated. And we also know that there's a lot of um, research coming through now that parental experiences of maths are passed on to the ch their children and this can cause um, a great influence on how the children also perceive um, their experiences of, of maths. So if a parent has a very poor experience of maths, the child can pick up on this very quickly. So let's now look at how children acquire math skills. All children are actually born with a sense of number. Um, and studies have shown that even babies can count. So if they're putting an, a group of objects up there that um, they can actually record the time that babies look at them um, and they can make decisions. I mean, you'll even know with young children, for example, if you give two young children um, a plate of chips and one one plate of chips or something has more than the other, that child will want 
that plate of chips, not the one that they've been given. So they have a good perception of, of number, and this has been built in. And before normal instruction, children learn about to develop math skills through play, and they are all good at mathematics. So this begs the question as to what happens when they get into school, what starts to make them not good mathematicians. And as I say, this sense of number is actually built into us as homo sapiens, but also it's built into um, animals. So for example, you've got two groups of hyenas here, and a lion would automatically know, for example, that if it wanted lunch, it would go for the group of hyenas on the left-hand side, because if it went for um, the group of hyenas on the right-hand side, it would be it would be the hyena's lunch rather than the hyena being its lunch. So this sense of, of number and quantity is actually something that has been built into us. But there is some very recent research that has found that some people, um, some people, there is an area of the brain used for understanding number that is defective. And these people have a condition called dyscalculia. Um, it affects 5% of the population and is distinguishable from other maths difficulties because of the fundamental inability to process the value of number. So a lot of children with dyslexia have problems with, with maths and with number, but their problems are what we would call dyslexia-related difficulties. Um, so they would, example, have problems with working memory and so find mental, um, mental maths very difficult or finding maths problems that have a number of steps in them very difficult. Um, they might transpose um, numbers instead of writing 34, write 43. Um, they may have difficulties with um, place value and writing the two in the right column for 100 tenths and units. They may have difficulties with sequencing their work so they get lost halfway through it. They might have difficulties with um, timekeeping. Um, they might have difficulties with recalling facts. Um, and all of those things are dyslexic type difficulties that are um, translated into maths learning difficulties. But the difference is, and this is where you get the distinguishable thing, is that your dyslexic learner who has maths difficulties will fundamentally have quite a good understanding of number. And in fact, when I started my career as a maths teacher, and it was a second career because I was in design before, because I was dyslexic, um, and I had a bottom set of, of, um, of children um, and they could never get anything down on paper. And I used to go to my head of department and I said, these are bright mathematicians, but they're, they're going to be um, forecast to, you know, get a very low grade at GCSE because of their dyslexic type difficulties that were impacting on maths. But as I say, at the end of the day, they were good mathematicians. They just couldn't get the work down. So dyscalculics are people who don't have this good um, sense of number, although, and they may also have a whole, um, you know, a whole lot of other, other um, difficulties that are similar to the dyslexics, like the recall of information, the sequencing, the timekeeping, the mixing up numbers, and not being able to get the numbers down on the page properly, all those sort of difficulties. So this is what it, it sort of feels like with a, dis, a person with dyscalculia, is that they wouldn't know what the value of the number is. So would you be paying two pounds, 20 pounds, 200 pounds, or 200,000 pounds for a pair of shoes. Not Jimmy Choo's, um, for example, but just a normal, a normal pair of shoes that you should have, if you've got a good sense of number, you would have a good idea um, 
what you should you would pay for a pair of shoes providing that you've had that experience so for example a four-year-old child might not know how much you would pay for a pair of shoes and a 12 year old child maybe not know how much you would spend um, how much a house would cost so you learn the relative values of numbers as you grow up as well so you'd also be able to maybe estimate how many beans there are in a jar so it's looking at that and saying would there be 20 200 20,000 or 200,000 you would actually be able to give a reasonably sensible answer so how much would you pay um, if you went to if you didn't if you weren't told how much the rupee cost and you went to indonesia for a holiday um, so you went to the store and you bought a sandwich and you were told that the sandwich was going to cost you 20,000 rupees. Now, 20,000 is a big number and you would probably say to yourself, gosh, I wonder whether that, whether I'm being ripped off or not. So then if you bought a Coca-Cola from um, a, different, a different vendor and that was 15,000 rupee, your brain would be able to say, well, the sandwich cost me 20,000 rupee, the Coke cost me 15,000 rupee. So it's, it's in the right sort of quantity. So your brain would be saying, you know, that's, that's okay. You would have made a sensible decision. Now, a person with dyscalculia isn't able to do that because they cannot relate the number that they hear to the quantity or the value of what something is and that is fundamental to um to people with dyscalculia so here's a nice little cartoon um where she said where charlie brown is saying to his sister um all right let's try another one what's two and a half times two and a half and she answers 10 million and charlie brown says no it's six and a quarter and her answer is i'm getting closer so she clearly doesn't really have a good perspective of um, you know the value between six and a quarter for example and 10 million so we all at some point in time get to numbers that are so big that we don't understand them like for example if I said to you how many blades of grass are there in a football field that you might be able to guess to make a guess but re really you haven't got any reference points um, because you've never had to do that much counting and likewise if I asked you how many hairs there are on your head you would have difficulty giving me a number some of you may say you know four million some some others might say three hundred thousand there's a big difference between four million and three hundred thousand somebody might say you know an even bigger number than that you're getting into the sort of google numbers so we haven't got reference points for that um, and this was from Ronick Bird, who is a lovely author of uh, Dyscalculia and Maths Learning Difficulties. So if you Google Ronick Bird, she, you'll come up with lots of really nice, useful videos. So which, as I say, with children with Dyscalculia, they, their problem is that they cannot um, have this number awareness at very small numbers. Like we might have not have it at very big numbers, but they get it at very small numbers. So if you said, would it be sensible to eat 15 little chips that they could manage? But 15, which is the same number of hamburgers would not be a sensible thing to do. And it's that it's getting that relative understanding of what that 15 means. And another thing with these um, children who have dyscalculia is that they cannot subitize. So somebody else would look at that and automatically go, that's five. Um, it would get more difficult if we're subitizing bigger number of dots, but for smaller number of dots, we would be able to give a sensible answer. Again, a child with dyscalculia would not be able to match those number of dots, five, to the number five they would have to count them um, because they don't have that ability to estimate um, quantities. 
So when children start to learn um, about number, they normally start by learning number songs. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, once I caught a fish alive and 10 fat sausages sizzling a pan and five little ducks went swimming one day. So at this point, the children are only learning words. They're still not learning what those really mean. It's just um, a word like a fish, it's a three, it's a sausage, it's a nine. Yes, They're not making any relationship between the words and what numbers are. Um, but at least they're learning, you know, learning the words, they're forming their language. And these are some other very, very important prerequisite skills for learning maths. That a child needs to be able to follow a sequence and recognize patterns in things. They need to be able to estimate and make a reasonable guess at things. Um, they need to be able to order size or order numbers by size that are bigger or smaller or items rather, because we still haven't got into numbers yet. Um, they need to be able to sort items according to the sort of category they are or the shape or the color. Um, they need to learn about horizontal and vertical directions, backwards and forwards, up and down. And they need to start developing spatial awareness and shape. And as I say, proper language skills that underpin maths. So it's not just about numbers. You need to have all this, these good building blocks to be able to do maths. So let's see how young children can acquire them. It's very important to foster these early skills very early. So even with the three little bears, instead of just saying the story, um, that you could be sort of talking to your child about um, what would happen if Goldilocks sat in the big chair or the middle sized chair or the little chair? And at, this is the very early um, sort of child recognizing that it's estimating and sizing. So, a very important prerequisite skill. Then you've got sorting, you know, sorting by um, colors or shapes or feel or texture. Again, very important that, um, that they learn how to sort because again, that, that's the skill required for maths. And then we've got ordering and measuring by size. So getting out all their teddies and asking them to put them in order of size. Again, developing these prerequisite skills that one needs for maths. And then we've got more or less. Um, having two piles of different objects and asking them what is more or less. Um, and again, this is one of the things that children who have a, um, a, a tendency, if you like, to having maths learning difficulties will find this, this very difficult or not get it right. And it is, it's now seen that those children who have difficulties in these very early skills do not go on to develop math skills easily so as again early identification is very important because we can start to to work on that you know are there more or less because if they can't identify this sort of um more or less of groups of objects then when they come to actually see the digits it's very difficult for them to be able to say, well, I see the digit nine. It doesn't represent anything because it's just a symbol. And is it more than five? You know, so they've got difficulty with this. They're going to have difficulty with with sequencing and ordering numbers when they become, you know, symbols. So spatial awareness, another very important prerequisite skill. Um, you know, will the teddy fit in that tiny pram? And children need to experiment on this. You know, you will see them getting some huge, great, huge, great teddy and try and stick it into something really small. And they learn that, they learn the comparisons of size. Um, and that's, again, it's very, a very important skill. Lego, of course, is, is an important um, tool to be able to build and you, they can start to do 
start to getting the one-to-one -one correspondence in, in counting those objects, but also building, building things that are developing spatial awareness skills. Another one is um, putting things in sequence and seeing patterns. Spotting patterns in maths is, again, a very, very important underpinning skill. Um, and, that, and again, problem solving. So when they see different sequences like this, they need to work out what comes, what comes next. And again, this sort of problem solving, and this is called mental flexibility in problem solving. Um, so which is the odd one out? Which two are the same and which two are different and why? So you could say, for example, that the odd one out is the bat. Um, and if you ask the child why, they would say, well, the whale and the duck go in water. Good answer. Or they could say that the, sorry, the dolphin, that the dolphin is the odd one out. And you would say, why? And they would say, because the other two um, can fly, they have wings. So um, it's looking at these problem solving, this mental flexibility, developing this mental flexibility of matching things and seeing why things are different. Again, a very important skill that underpins maths. So then we start to develop a number sense. And this is when children um, have heard through the songs that there were three little piggies and that they're they've now got a fifth birthday party or a fourth birthday party so they're beginning to match um, the word of the number to the number of objects um, and then they need to be able to also sort objects into piles that's another very important um, very important skill so sharing things out at this stage um, and then learning the early language skills for maths. So bigger than, smaller than, more than, less than, over, under, behind, in front, forwards, backwards, too much, not enough. So those are the early language skills for maths. Then, of course, they will go on to learn the more specific language skills. You know, then they would learn the the um, language skills that are associated with subtraction and uh, multiplication and equals and things like that. So they're getting the la they're developing the language. They're developing the prerequisite skills through play, um, and they are beginning to develop an awareness that the word that they hear is matched with a quantity. So three, three candles on the birthday cake because I'm going to be three. Um, and then they might start counting. Now, again, this is where you will start to spot children who have got difficulties, that they may be able to count a row of counters that are all the same size, all the same color, all in a row. So they would count one, two, three, four, five, but they're still, you know, they're still um, just counting an object, but that object doesn't necessarily have a value. They would then have more difficulties counting things that are a different shape, different colour, and not in a row. And that's when you'll start to see, hang on a second, these children are not getting that one-to-one -one correspondence of what they are saying and matching it with a particular counter. They'll have even more difficulties um, with the cardinal number system, first, second, third, because in the first group, you've got five items and you've got more items than you have in the second group. But second comes after first. So shouldn't second be bigger than first? So you can start to see that some children will work it out and some children will have difficulty with this sort of concept. So this is when they're sort of beginning to be ready for school. So young, young children can estimate quantity, although may, they may not know which digit 
to use to label that quantity. So as I say, they may be able to count it, they may be able to sing it, um, but they're not using the digits yet. And the digits are sort of numbers. So when they start school, they are usually, they are introduced to digits, um, and usually they're introduced to digits on a number line. But actually, what they need to know is that there is a graphical image for the digit, there is a phoemic image for the digit, in other words, it's a five, you say five, and that's what five is, it's, that's its digit, its graphical image, but also that it represents a quantity. Um, and we don't use enough of these, what we call visual clusters, to represent what that five means, because there's actually nothing in the symbol that says it's a five. So if children just use a number line and they're not using the clusters with the number line and they're not making that matching, they are very, you know, they're not getting off to a really good start in maths. Because when children learn phonics, they have to look at the letter, they get the sound of the letter, they get the name of the letter, and then they can build words with that letter in it. Um, and then in building the words, they know that um, that you know that's the word and it's got a sound and the sound is a word that represents a cat or something. In maths, they need to be looking for the symbol. They need to know the sound of the symbol or the digit. So it's a five and I know that I say five. Then they need to match the symbol to the array. And the array is what we mean by a dot pattern. And therefore they have an idea of the quantity of that, the meaning of that number. And that's very, very important. That is a really fundamental skill to be able to match the sound, the digit and the array. Because one of the things that is more complicated in maths than in, in say, learning um, letters is the fact that our digits also have different values. So, for example, you could have a five size shoe, which is that size, and a person that is five foot, they are both five. And that, again, can be very confusing to a child to adjust to the different magnitudes of those numbers. And that's why it's important to have the arrays and introduce them to lots of different things that represent the five. So, for example, here, you could have the numicon, which is five, the number line, which is five, the size five shoe, five candles, five p, five ducks, the number five bus, the five foot tall person. So getting them, helping them to, to see that that five represents all those different things, not just the number line. And this is where Numicon is amazing. Um, the Numicon teaches you the flexibility of number and it teaches children the arrays of the numbers. And if you don't, if they don't have Numicon in school, buy some Numicon on eBay um, because it's the best thing that you can do, even for your really little children. They've got they've got a lovely texture, and you will be able to. You know, you can ask the children, for example, to um, see how many of the little purple ones, second from the in, which we see as two, how many little purple ones fit on the blue one, which is number six. So the child is beginning to match all those shapes and beginning to learn how numbers are broken up. And then when they're introduced to the digits, they can start to see that the number seven can be made up in that they've got the dot pattern of a six that you can see like the domino pattern and a one, or it's got the dot pattern of a three and a four, or it's got the dot pattern of a five and a two, and this is called flexibility with number. And all the research points to the fact that children who have flexibility of number do well in maths. And we get too hung up, for example, on number bonds, number bonds to 10. But actually, we should have number bonds for every single number. So the eight, it can be made of a seven and one, a six and a two, a four and a four, three and a five. 
It can be made of all these different things. And if child has flexibility of number, they are no longer afraid of big numbers because those big numbers can all be broken down into little numbers. Um, and that is the foundation of being able to to work with numbers and to work even with big numbers. So let's, yes, we need a number line, but let's match that number line with what those digits actually mean rather than just having them in a row like that. So this also is what we call number sense, is developing this sense of number. And, you know, what is, what is sixness? It's a four and a two, it's a seven minus one, it's a five and a one, it's a double three, it's a half four. If a child can come up with these, all these different um, ways of thinking of a number, um, then they, they've really got the grasp of number and the flexibility of number. As Masha Mahesh Sharma, who's a very good um, research person in the field of maths, he says that knowing the 49 sight facts in a number is equivalent to knowing sight words in learning to read. So we know the sight words in learning to read um, are all the things like what and that and they and there and everything. Um, and the child needs to be able to recall those instantly um, in order to be able to become a fluent reader in the same way that a child needs to have the fluency of knowing how to make an eight. So if they see a three um, and they, you know, when they're adding on for 10 or something like that, and they've got a seven plus an eight, they can sort of go, okay, I can break my eight into a three and a five. I can put the three with the number seven that's going to make a 10. My answer is 15. Um, and so when they've got that, it cuts down on having to remember all these different things. And it also cuts down in counting in ones. And that's another um, key feature of dyscalculia is the fact that children count in ones, which is fine if they're counting small numbers, but when they're counting big numbers, that, that whole process breaks down. But it doesn't if they've got these sort of sight facts. And these sight facts can also be used with much different bigger numbers because, as I say, that they are the foundation skills of all numbers. And so we can do also another thing you can do is use playing cards. Um, and for example, you can do playing cards and get the child to see the numbers within numbers. So seeing the five within a playing card of nine or what R Ronick Bird uses, which is um, sticking colored dots onto a clear acetate. So you can see that if you put the, the, dot, the top two on the top of the three, you're getting a five. So you're decomposing that number, you're partitioning that number into a three and a five. And again, that's the beginning to develop this flexibility of number. And you can play all these sort of games with your children, dominoes, marvelous game, for getting them to recognize these arrays and dot patterns. So, you know, as I say, in the six dot pattern, you can see the four and the two, or you can see two lots of three. So they're getting familiar with the fact that numbers are made up of no other numbers. Uno Rummy is a great favorite of mine um, because you've got the sequencing of numbers there, you've got color coding of the same numbers. Um, and the little ones, they will do, they'll match the numbers. They won't necessarily be able to do the sequence, but they can certainly, you know, do three tens in a row with different colors, for example. Snakes and ladders, again, another great game to play. Um, and this is where you're getting the, the counting system and you're also introducing to, to the hundred square. Um, so sometimes you might want to design your own so that you're going from one all the way down to 100 at the bottom, but that's getting them again familiar with, with counting numbers and what the numbers mean. So, as I say, the other um, thing with um, the young children is that they may have difficulties with the language of maths. Um, that, you know, they've got different words that in English have different words to what they are in um, in math, so operation, for example, something you go into hospital with. Writing an expression is actually writing a word equation. 
And you've got multiple meanings for the things like add and addition, sum and plus. Um, you know, th those all mean add and subtraction means minus and take away and multiplication means lots of and times. So be very clear that if your child is getting confused with those terms, that you actually have a symbol and you match what they are saying to the symbol. And here's another little funny um, cartoon from from um, the peanuts. A subtraction? Oh, yes, ma'am, I can explain it. Subtraction is the awful feeling, you know, when you know less today than you do yet than you did yesterday. So, yes, let's think about the right terminology and using the right language is also very important. And this is often where you get the difference between um, the generations. Um, and we shouldn't now be using words like borrowing and carrying. But in schools, we now use exchange. So we don't go and borrow a 10. We exchange that 10 for 10 ones. Um, and I remember helping a little girl once um, and she was having difficulty with that. She had a, um, a 17 plus a 15 and she was adding the seven and the five and she said, that's 12. Um, but I don't know whether I'm putting the two on the, my neighbor's doorstep or the one on my neighbor's doorstep. So she had this image in her mind that she added them up and she had to put a number in the next column like it was the next door house. But she didn't know which one to use, which one to put. And this was because she didn't have the fundamental understanding of exchange and the fact that you need to exchange tens for ten ones. So also you'll find with your child that there are different methods now of teaching maths. Um, and so ask your child you know, to show you the method that they use and don't say to them, oh, that's not how we used to do it in school. Because you'll find that a lot of the language and a lot of the maths are ways that you, they have, that you did it are different from theirs. So if necessary, go and speak to the maths teacher and say to them, how are you actually teaching this now? And we, instead of using sort of columns a lot, we're now using these sort of number lines and cuisinaire rods and or counting lines and cuisinaire rods so that we're breaking numbers down and adding them in groups of 10. So children can also find the abstract nature of maths difficult and its notation. This is this is very clear. So don't worry if your children still if your child still needs to use abstract materials because I even with my big 16 year old boys, I am not afraid of getting out the, the concrete materials and their face sort of drops. But you get out the bricks or the, you know, the, the rods and the little cubes and you demonstrate what it is that you are trying to do with long division or with um, multiplication or something. And then you take take the 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 concrete materials away and they will immediately say oh please can I do it with those so don't be afraid of of using um, drawings and using materials with them and not pushing them into this abstract nature of maths because some great mathematicians will never be doing it in the abstract way so here we have another one sorry it's not an awfully good um, quality um, now say cut an apple in half. We have two halves, don't we? That's fractions. You're trying to teach me fractions. You know I'll never understand fractions. What are you trying to do with me? You're crazy. So again, this sort of peanuts thing and children are terrified of fractions, but they shouldn't be if they are introduced to them early enough. So let's have a quarter of a piece of cake. Let's have half a pizza. Let's do the, you know, talk about that bring that language in and also folding is a great example of fold that in half fold that in a quarter if you folded it in two what's the size of that you've got because fractions are a different difficult concept for children to understand they often think that a quarter has to be bigger than a half because it's got a four there instead of a two so getting them to do folding exercises 
Money also is difficult because the size of the coin isn't always representative of the value of that coin. So again, using money to exchange, if you wanted to go to the shop and, and buy something with, um, the, with the 50p coin, um, go and exchange it for 10, 10p coins, and then it's still not right. Change the 10p coin in one of the 10p coins into a 1p coin. So you're building this, this concept, a very important concept of exchange. And cooking, of course, is a wonderful, um, a wonderful tool to use maths. You know, how many measuring out the things using those numbers and even spatial awareness to cut out your mince pies to see how many mince pies you might get in that piece of pastry. Again, good spatial awareness skills. Times tables have always been a huge problem, but actually we only need to know our two, three and five times tables. And then we can make up every other times table from that. The four times table is double two, the six times table is double three. So if they know how to do two, threes and fives, which they can do by step counting, so two, four, six, eight, or three, six, nine, and then fives, five, 10, 15, they can make up every single other times tables. And times tables should never be an instant recall of that. It should be a gener you know, to generate the, um, the tables. So, you know, it's awful when you're suddenly being asked what's seven times four. You're not normally asked to do that in a GCSE exam or later on. So you shouldn't really be asked to recall it like that. And learning them by rote, like one times two is two, two times three is six, that's meaningless as well. It's much better to put down rows of counters and go, okay, this is one lot of two, two lots of two, two, three lots of two. So how many lots of two have we got? Three lots of two, how many is that? That's six, instead of reciting it like a parrot. So here we go, again, another little cartoon. I can't do this math problem. It has threes and fours in it. I can't do problems that have threes and fours. And Charlie Brown says, what will you do when you get eights and nines? I'll be sick on that day. And this is what happens to children, is that when they feel they're out of their comfort zone, they opt out and they're sick. And this is because maths anxiety is actually a very recognized condition. And children as young as eight can have maths anxiety. So being put on the spot to recite those multiplication tables, getting the answer wrong, thinking that maths is always a wrong or right answer, not that you're nearly right, that really counts, that's important, you're nearly right, um, not just right and wrong, and then comparisons with peers. So again, another little cartoon for you. Um, how can I multiply four and a half by six and five eighths? That's ridiculous. Why should I learn that? I bet I'll, in my life I'll never be able to multiply four and a half by six and five eighths. What makes you think so? And she says, I'll refuse to do it. So another thing, when they're not understanding what's going on with maths. But actually, maths is everywhere. And the study of numbers is absolutely beautiful. Um, in a sunflower, for example, you've got the number of seeds going one direction and the number of seeds going the other direction is actually a series in the Fibonacci series as our acorns, as our, as our petals in the flower, um, as is the nautilus shell, as is the golden triangle, as are ferns. So all around us, we've got this, these sort of beautiful um, patterns that are numbers that have come from nature. We've also got things like um, wallpaper patterns and repetitive patterns that are all actually coming under the study of maths. And Escher, my, my dissertation when I did my maths degree was all about the study of Escher and finding a pattern underneath his little lizards. That's all maths. Looking for um, patterns in windows, in all sorts of things, that's all part of maths. And road signs. So maths is all around us, numbers are all around us, and we need to try and bring up our children so 
that they're not afraid of all these of all these numbers. They can all be broken down into smaller numbers and each number represents something. So flowers, petals in a flower, street names, windows, all sorts of things like that. So thank you. And I'd like to just finish off by saying, look for numbers and patterns all around you. Numbers of buses, everything. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Brenda. Um, so we have got literally a few minutes left, so I will try and get through a couple of questions just quickly. Um, so we have a, had a question from Lindsay. So Lindsay's um, got a 10 year old who has quite a few learning difficulties. So dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia. And she's asking, should they focus on individual problems like math problems, reading problems, et cetera, or, or just take more of a holistic approach? It's, I know when um, there's lots of different things going on, do you think they should focus on individual things or, or just take it as the child comes sort of thing? I think if it's, it's, it's going back to Numicon. Um, not that I'm a salesperson of Numicon, but getting her to be able to see shapes and patterns because maths is not just about numbers, it's about shapes and patterns and doing those dot patterns and having a five and breaking it up into a two and a three. Um, though that if you get that right at um, with somebody who's got very you know who's not feeling very confident in maths and matching um, arrays to um, the digit, then you've got the basis of doing, as I say, um, addition. If you've got a, a little shape that's a four and you put the shape of a three onto it, it's going to make a seven. And then you can take the, you know, what the shape is and then write the abstract alongside so they can start to see that that is, you're adding that. And how many lots of the little twos fit into the shape of a six? That is actually sort of multiplication and division. You're putting those fundamental um, building blocks in and you're doing it in a very um, a constructive but also non-threatening way and that's what what you need to do we go into abstract maths far too early and they need lots of time to play and those even the older children take them back to to playing with these these dot patterns these arrays seeing numbers within numbers how many different ways can you make a seven challenge them um, and then you're going to get good mathematical thinking. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Um, Jamie is asking, how would you suggest the understanding of um, reading time? Any tips for helping a child with um, this failure to read, read time? Um, I wish we had another hour for that. Um, <laughs> and I think analog clocks are really tricky. Um, and you know the first thing to start off with is with a uh, with a digital clock and getting them to understand um for example the how time passes so you could be sitting down and saying okay it's seven o'clock now and we're going to watch this television program or we're going to have supper and now how what what's the time now it's 20 past seven which is 20 minutes past seven and there are 60 minutes in an hour they need to know that 60 minutes in an hour um but starting off with not just reading a clock but having a comprehension about what time means and what it means and we go to bed at eight o'clock we get up at 6 30 in the morning um it takes me 30 minutes to to get dressed so if i add my 30 minutes and get to the 60 that's seven o'clock that sort of thing i think you've got to establish that before you start reading clocks get awareness of time great thank you and just one well i'll try and squeeze in two in this as, as stacy is asking what's the average age that maths um dyscalculia is picked up in schools and of, ingrid's also asking about um do you recommend intervention for dyscalculia in schools Absolutely. I mean, intervention, it's to say maths learning difficulties. Uh, dyscalculia is very rare. Um, it's, it's to say it's only 5% of the population and it's very specific to, um, you know, this, this inability to understand quantity, quantity of number, um, what we call um, symbolic and, and non-symbolic magnitude comparisons to use technical terms. Um, so, it, it, that's rare and you you would see that because they're starting to count in ones on their fingers and they're not they're very reliant on a number line um 
And the if you're really interested in, in the dyscalculia bit, Ronick Bird's video on YouTube, which is called The Parental Guide to Dyscalculia, is fantastic. Um, but a lot of other children, and, and as I say, a huge portion of them, as we saw at the very beginning of my presentation, lots of children are failing in maths and they have failed, well, they, they, they're losing confidence in maths by the time they're eight. Now, they are not dyscalculic. What they're doing is that they've been introduced to the digit, but they haven't got in their brain what that digit means. And so very quickly, they start getting into big numbers, you know, 16, and they haven't got the idea that 16 is a 10 and a six. Um, but if they've been playing with Numicon and things like that from a very young age, they get that sense of flexibility of number and the children with good flexibility of number at a very young age through play and things like that go on to, do, to be good at maths later on. So as I say, even with Numicon, you can take the shape and you can say, well, what's half of it? You've already introduced a fraction. So you haven't, when you, when then when they're at school and say, we're going to do fractions, they're not getting the reaction that that the little girl in the peanuts was going, ah, I can't do fractions. You know, that they've already been brought up to those. And that's what's very important, getting those very, those confident skills at a very early age. Some great advice. Thank you, Brenda. Um, there is actually, we've run out of time. We have got, we've got lots of more questions coming through and lots of thank yous um, saying that you've really helped people understand it better now, um, which is, is the whole point of this evening really is to help give some support and advice, but also to help explain. And um, so us as parents understand it a little bit better as well. Um, so just, just to remind everybody to keep an eye on our website and social media, um, where we're continuing to provide um, help and support where we can. Um, and that just leaves me to say thank you, Brenda, and to everyone thank for you. joining us. And have a great um, rest of the evening. And I don't mind if you um, email me through the BDA um, at Brenda F at bdadyslexia.org.uk so that's Brenda F as in um, fairy not S because people get that much up so if you do have any burning questions then please do email me and I'd be very happy to answer them for you that's very kind thank you Brenda all right so have Take a good care. evening bye good night. bye bye, bye. 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 good night <laughs>